Y'all ready? You packed your bags and you shut the door. You crossed the sea to fight a war. You didn't know just what would happen to you. Stepped in the dirt, boots on the ground, and gunfire was the only sound. And to yourself you whispered hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Every day and every night you walked the walk and you fought the fight you never saw the end inside now did you the days are washing the haze of red the blood the mud too many dead your weary soul was crying hallelujah hallelujah shot you know you're in a deadly spot you never thought the day would come now did ya your brother falls down to the ground the enemy is all around and from your lips you scream hallelujah 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. You fought the fight till it was done. You had the strength to carry on. You thought it'd be much better back home, did ya? Try each day, keep pushing through, but the battle lives inside of you. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. 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 As we continue in, in the series in, in Acts here, we're talking about chapter 8, and, and um, I want to remind you where we left off last week with Philip <clears throat> sharing the gospel with the Samaritans of all people, those dog Samaritans down across the other side of the railroad tracks, you know, where you don't want to go, those people. And Philip went down there. Let's look at a recap in verse 5 of Acts chapter 8. It says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria, and he proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lamed were healed, so that there was great joy in the city. Now, while Philip was still telling the Samaritans about Jesus, he still sharing his faith. I don't, Philip is not a preacher, so I don't want you to think, well, the preacher went down from Jerusalem. Philip was one who was a disciple. He was a believer in Jesus Christ. But I guess anybody who proclaims the gospel is a proclaimer or a preacher of the gospel. Amen? So I guess he was. Ah, so are you as you proclaim the gospel of Christ. 
So an angel of the Lord at that time spoke to him. In verse 26, we see this, and he said, Go south of the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And this is kind of a, an area of Jerusalem's up here, and Gaza's down the seacoast line down here, headed towards Egypt. And uh, the Spirit speaks to him. I, I want you to, to get the idea here that Philip is susceptible. He listens to God speaking to him. This is so important. If he wasn't listening, if he wasn't intentionally doing the Lord's work, then he might have missed an opportunity that could change the impact of one man speaking to another that would affect an entire country. So this may kind of seem counterproductive. I, would, I first looked at this, I said, here's Philip, he's in Samaria. They got a revival going on. They got, he, he's telling people about Jesus is the Messiah to a people who are, remember, Samaritans are half Jews. They're Jews that intermarried with Gentiles, so they're half-breeds. They're those people on the other side of the track, so to speak. And he's preaching to them. He's telling them about Jesus. The mission's going good. He, people are coming to Christ. There are believers being rebirthed by the Spirit. And God says, I want you to leave there. Now, this sounds to me counterproductive on, at face value. But God had something bigger for Philip to do. You say, how can it be bigger from preaching in Samaria to all these people and people coming to Christ to go to one man and talk to him? Well, we're going to see how that works out. You may recall a time when someone that you know was doing the work of God and it was, uh, God was blessing and God was doing a work in their life and all, and then, wow, God tells them to up and leave. Has that ever happened? Well, I've seen it happen. But let's take a minute. I want to revisit the character of this man, Philip. I want to look at who he is. He was one of the believers who were scattered following the stoning of Stephen in Jerusalem. You remember Stephen? I about got run out of a, I got criticized really bad. I was supply preaching at a church one time. I won't say where it was. It was interesting. It's been many, many years ago. But I was supply preaching there for a couple of weeks because the pastor was on vacation. And I preached a sermon about Stephen. And I said, Stephen preached a gospel that was for everybody. He said, it's a universal gospel. But because of some of the prejudices in the church, they had some bad things to say about me that I was going to try to get those other people to come into the church. Yeah, I guess so. That's what the gospel says. Uh, everyone is invited. So he was scattered following the stoning of Stephen. He was one of those that persecution broke out against the Christians at that point when Stephen was persecuted and died. And so Philip went to Samaria. He took off out of Dodge, and which wasn't a Jewish community at all, as I said, but half-breeds, Jews who had intermarried with Gentiles. And furthermore, we know that he wasn't a preacher. <laughs> he didn't go to seminary. He didn't have a degree. He was kind of like you and me before I went to seminary for a little while. <laughs> so I want you to understand Philip because it's important when we get to the end of where we're going today to realize that Philip is not some high, lifted up, educated uh, guy who sat under Gamiel as Paul did, a rabbi that was well known. Philip was just a believer. Are you that? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Then follow the track that Philip did here and watch what Philip did as a believer. First of all, I want to pick up in chapter 8, verse 26, where we see the first of three miracles. Now, when I started this text this week, I was looking at it, and I said, actually, I got to the end of it, and I said, wow, now that's a miracle. I said, you know, there's probably more miracles in this text, and I'm, I don't want to miss the miracles. So I looked there, and, and I saw the first miracle is in verse we're starting in 26. It's a miracle where God is speaking to a man. That's a miracle, isn't it? A miracle is defined as anything supernatural. Well, this is supernatural. The God of heaven 
is speaking to a lowly believer. I say lowly. There are no lowly believers really, are they? We're all in Christ and therefore we're something really special. Don't let that go to your head. Verse 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south on the road. Listen, what road? Go, go out of Samaria where the revival's going on. Go south towards Egypt, towards Gaza on a desert road. So he's going from a very populated area and God is sending him away from the revival, sending him away from people that he can talk to to go by himself down a dusty desert road towards Egypt. Amen. Hmm. I don't know what he was thinking. I'd like to have been a fly on the wall. Hello, God, what are you doing? I mean, it's all happening right here and you're sending me down there. There's nobody down there, Lord. 27 says, so he started out. He did what God said. He listened to the voice of God. God spoke and he listened, he obeyed, he started out. And on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace. Some Bibles say Candace and some say Candace. It doesn't matter, it's all the same person. Uh, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem, we're talking about the eunuch, had gone to Jerusalem for what purpose? The Bible says to worship. And on his way, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of the Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. I want to mention something here and I want to dwell on it, but I want you to understand here that this guy had a scroll, Isaiah the prophet, That was probably one of the most treasured scrolls that anybody could have, usually only found in the temple or in the synagogue. The fact that he had a copy of this meant he was very rich, had a lot of money. This was very valuable. This was not just pick up a book off of a shelf. The Ethiopia mentioned here in the text does not refer to the modern country of Ethiopia, but to an ancient kingdom called Nubia, northwest of today's Ethiopia. So it wasn't quite where we think it is today. The term eunuch had become synonymous with a government official's post. We know what the term eunuch actually means, but it had become in this day and time synonymous with someone who was government position in the court of the king or queen or whatever uh, ruler there might have been. So it's doubtful that this man was physically altered since the text tells us that he went to the temple to worship which was not allowed of a true eunuch. True eunuch had been altered. He was not allowed into the temple. So we see that he was either a God-fearer or more likely a proselyte who was able to participate in the Passover and other Jewish feasts. I want to share with you the difference Uh, between a God-fearer and a proselyte. God-fearers believed in and feared the God of the Jews. They sat and listened in the synagogues but could not participate. A proselyte, however, were God-fearers who had been circumcised and bound themselves to keep the Mosaic law and therefore could participate, including in the Jewish festivals. So we believe that he was a proselyte. What we find here is that a devout believer in Yahweh was reading the scripture in Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. That's a good text to write down. Isaiah 57, uh, 53, 7 and 8 on his way back home. He's headed home. He's been worshiping. He's headed home. He is actually in a chariot. Now this chariot, I know if you've seen some of the movies, you got this little round chariot thing with two wheels, a guy with the reins and a spear or something and and he's barely got room for one or two people in there. That's probably not what this chariot looked like. It was more like uh, an area that had a driver or someone to take care of the horse and then some seat or a bench or something behind that. And that's a picture I want in your mind as we talk about this passage so you can see it. Um, We find here that um, in Isaiah 53 it says, this is a second miracle by the way, A second miracle, Isaiah 53, yes. It's when God becomes the sacrifice himself. It says there in verse 32, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. Here's what it said. He, 
was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and a lamb, as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. We know this is talking about Messiah. We know this is talking about Jesus. We're on this side of the cross. We've studied. We understand. We got a handle on this. But not so earlier. But I want you to, before I comment on that, I want you to look at verse 30. He said, Brother Stan, you're just going backwards. I know. It's okay. 32. Now we're going back to 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And do you understand what you're reading was his question. Do you understand what it is in the scroll, in the Bible, in the Word of God that you are reading? And here's his response. How can I? How can I understand unless someone explains it to me? So he invites Philip to come up into the chariot, sit down on the bench with him, and the two of them uh, are there together, and Philip starts this. The man was obviously stopped beside the road. He was reading. By the way, reading is a custom to read out loud. They didn't read silently. They read it out loud if they read something. Keep in mind, not everybody could read. So when you read, you read it out loud. I don't know if that was so everybody would know you could read or so that they could hear it. So Philip's question is, do you understand? It opens up a dialogue between the two. We were talking this morning in our Bible study class about opening up dialogue to share Christ. We were talking about asking questions and not being condemning when someone is seeking possibly, or maybe you don't know if they're seeking God or not, but consequently you're going to talk to them about God. Well, the first thing you don't ask them is, you going to heaven or you going to hell? That's not the way to initiate the conversation. There are good ways, and there are multiple ways, and certainly it depends on the circumstances at the time. But he asked, do you understand what you're reading? As happens with many people who read the scriptures, they read, but they don't understand what it means. I know I am that way sometimes. Sometimes I read the scripture. I take it at face value, but I really don't understand it. However, this is what's interesting. I don't realize I don't understand it. I think I understand it. Anybody heard someone say, well, I read this in the Bible, and I think it means, you heard them say that? I think it means, and, you know, we do that because that's what we think it means, but the truth of the matter is there's one, only one meaning of Scripture. There's only one interpretation, and it's given by the Holy Spirit, and so we need to read it, but after we've read it, we need to dissect it. After we've done that, we need to study it. We need to compare it to other parts of the scriptures because they do not contradict each other. So he is saying, do you understand? Now, you think being in the temple, hearing the priest, reading the Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah, because they read Isaiah a lot. It was one of their favorites. They would have heard this scripture was referring to. They, they should have known who it was referring to. But keep in mind, the Jews had no concept that this was their Messiah. Why not? Because they're reading something that talks about one who will suffer, who has been humiliated, who was, will be put to death. And they're saying, that's not our king, that's somebody else, it's some prophet. No idea, no concept of Isaiah 53. They read it, they interpreted it, but they misunderstood it. So like many people today, we read the text, <clears throat> maybe even in the temple, but we really don't understand what we read. Today we have God's Holy Spirit, not only to help us understand it, but also to lead us into all truth and application. It's important as a spirit reveals the truth of God's word to us that we don't just hoard it. We don't just put it on a shelf or hide it in our heart. Although we ought to, David says, I know, hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. But we need to proclaim that truth. We need to apply it to our lives also. Today, God's Holy Spirit will help us do that. God uses teachers and preachers to help us understand. But it's the Holy Spirit who brings the light to God's word to our hearts. That we can live by it. That we can not just read it, understand it, hear it. But what James says, what does James say? To do it. 
to do it. I heard somebody, as I mentioned earlier this morning, <clears throat> some of you in my class this morning are getting a repeat of a few of these things, but a man I heard one time, he said, don't just be a hearer of the word of God, be a doer of it, do the sayings of Jesus. Amen? Now, as Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul said a lot of things. We need to do that too. But certainly, we need to do the sayings of Jesus. Next, we find a theological question that is answered in verse 34. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So when someone you're talking to about spiritual things opens a door like that, you better jump through it with both feet, amen? Because that's God doing that. And this is God in action here. He said, is he talking about himself or someone else? Look what verse 35 says. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Oftentimes, doors are open for us to share our testimony about what God's done in our life or to talk to somebody about eternal matters. Uh, you know, a lot of people are interested in spiritual things. They may not be interested in God or Jesus, but they're interested in spiritual things. Everybody is interested in, in <clears throat> staying young, for instance, longevity. Everybody is interested, even curious sometimes, <clears throat> about life after death, and they want to know about it because it scares them, because they don't know what to expect. A Christian should never be scared of what's next. Now, personally, I don't like pain, okay? So when I die, I've asked God, just let me lay down one night, go to sleep, go to heaven. My brother did that, and God said, okay. And he came home from work one day, he, his wife was fixing dinner, and he said, I'm going to lay down on the couch, grab me a quick snooze for dinner. When it's ready, wake me up, and, and we'll eat. He laid down on the couch, and he went home. I thought, that's what I wanted to do. He got to do that. That's what he wanted to do, and God honored that. It's amazing. So <clears throat> when we look at the good news, every Christian ought to be able to tell someone who is seeking to know God the good news. And I want to take a few minutes to remind you what the good news is. And the good news is that Jesus came down from heaven. He died on a cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose on the third day from the grave. He ascended back to the Father. Y'all remember these symbols, don't you? And he's coming back. Do you hear me? He is coming back. And he's going to do it soon. Now, what does soon mean? I'm not sure, but I know he's coming, and I need to be ready. I need to work like he's not coming for 100 years and live like he's coming in the next moment. But allow me to take a minute to be more specific about what Philip told the eunuch. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, he told him about Jesus, but I want to give you the modern-day approach to sharing your faith with someone. It's actually called faith. And if you'll remember F-A-I-T-H, and some of you do, we had a class on this earlier this year, um, then you'll understand that F is for forgiveness. So when you're talking to somebody and they say, well, you know, I I've been thinking about God and I don't know what's going to happen after I die, and, and let me share this with you. Can I share something that will take five minutes with five points and you will know? And, you know, when you tell them that, okay, I want to know, I want to know, faith. F is for forgiveness. Everyone has sinned and needs God's forgiveness. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> Romans 8, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness according to his grace. So F is for forgiveness. Then A, F-A, A is available. God's forgiveness is available for all. John 3, 16, who knows that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life in him. So the A is for available, but listen, it's not automatic. Forgiveness is not automatic. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody. Some people say it, but they haven't believed in Jesus. They haven't, and that word in, in John's gospel means to trust. It means that <clears throat> I believe this is going to hold me up so I can lean against it. I trust it. And with that trust comes action. So not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says on that day they'll stand at the judgment and they'll say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? And he looks at them and said, depart from me. I don't know you. You might have done miracles. Whose power did you do them in? I don't know, but it wasn't mine. I is for impossible. It's impossible to get into heaven on your own. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking if I had to get in heaven on my own, first thing I'd be thinking about is I got to get a ladder. Amen? By grace you are saved, the Bible says, through faith, not of your good works. So how can a sinful person have eternal life and get into heaven is the big question. And that brings us to the letter T. You got to turn from sin and self. I like to put selfishness. It's, <clears throat> I, have a <clears throat> I have a little puppy, and let me tell you, it's all about him. <laughs> it is all about him. And uh, I don't know, he needs a lot more, a lot of grace because it's all about him. When it's all about us, it can never be about God. In fact, if it's going to be about God, it cannot be it about us at all. Unless we turn. Turn means to repent, doesn't it? If you're driving down the road and somebody's in the car with you and they say, turn, what do you think they mean? It means change direction. So they're going to turn, and what we're turning from is sin and selfishness in our life, and we're turning to Christ. The Bible says, unless you repent, turn from your ways, you will perish. Turn to Jesus as your Savior and Lord. He says in the Scripture that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Let all denominations and all religions hear that statement. You do not go to God except through his Son, Jesus Christ. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And we do that a lot, don't we? A lot of people confess. The devil confesses that. He knows Jesus is Lord. So what does it say? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that's a trust. That means I, that God raised him from the dead. Yeah, I believe God raised him from the dead. But the word believe means to trust it, to put your life in his hands. So what happens if a person is willing to repent of their sins and confess Jesus? And that brings us <clears throat> to the H in faith, heaven. Don't you like that one? Heaven is a real place where we will go to live with God forever. Bible says, Jesus said these words when he left. He says, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Hallelujah. Eternal life begins now with Jesus when you come to Christ. He says that I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest, abundant life. I want to stop and say something about that right here. Many Christians who are saved and eventually when they die or the rapture, they're going to heaven, are not living an abundant life. And the reason for that is that they got one big foot in the world and one in the church or one with God. Amen? Not that the church is spiritual. It's a building. It's us, though. So if we are going to... If we're going to please God, then we are going to have to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow Jesus. There's no other option. So you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm good, Brother Stan. I know I'm going to heaven. I believe. I trust Jesus for my salvation. That's great. You're about a worthless to him sitting on this earth, aren't you? Now, I'm being obvious because I've been there at one point in time. I was saved, and I knew I was saved, and I was happy with that, but I was totally useless to God to be able to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, to do what God 
told us to do in Matthew 28, and it's to go and make disciples. That means I've got a certain standard by which I'm living, and I need to promote that in others. Say, go and make disciples. Isn't that the preacher's job? No. What is the subject of the verse, Matthew 28? You go and make disciples. You do it. Faith can also, under, uh, also stand for forsaking all, I trust him. Amen. So how can a person have forgiveness, eternal life in heaven, only through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Well, let me come back. Now that the eunuch believed the testimony of Philip concerning Jesus the Messiah, he asked an obvious question. He said, man, I believe. Jesus is the Messiah. This is the scripture talking about Jesus. You told me Jesus died on the cross and suffered under uh, the religious leader's hands, and this is a Messiah. He fits the bill of the prophecy. I believe. And as they traveled along in verse 36, along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, I can see this. Can't you see? They're driving along, the driver's up front, he and Philip, now Philip's still heading in the wrong direction, but he's with the eunuch, and a little chariot's bobbing along there, and the eunuch said, look, there's water. What stops me from being baptized? Isn't that a good question? What stops me? What prevents me? What stands in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders for the chariot to stop, so he recognized baptism. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Well, Philip had explained that Jesus fulfilled all that the prophets had spoken of concerning the suffering Messiah. All that believers in Jesus should identify with Christ. He told him that. The question, what can, I, what can stand in the way of me being baptized, clearly shows the understanding and significance that Philip placed on baptism. Baptism does not save. It does not wash your sins away. Otherwise, we'd all just get dunked every week. Amen? Even in the winter. Doesn't save you, doesn't wash you clean. But it does show that he understood the significance of baptism. It is a public profession, an outward expression of what has taken place spiritually on the inside of a person that's been changed by the Holy Spirit. So we got one, two, we, here's a third miracle. Look at verse 39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared as Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Now, Philip may have had quite a dusty walk and encounter to reach the Ethiopian eunuch, but immediately when the mission was completed, the Holy Spirit <clears throat> brought along a taxi cab, said, Philip, get in, we're going to take you back. Brought along another chariot, give him a ride home. You know, the rapture's kind of like this. It's kind of a picture of the rapture, isn't it? Uh, many of you have taken airplane rides and gone up, but this is a plain air ride here that we're seeing. And look what he says. He appeared at Azotus. The Holy Spirit snatched him away and planted him in another town, probably some 10 miles away. Talk about a trip. Wow, <laughs> a plain air ride. So here's our take home. Here's what I want to share with you. No, I don't want to go there yet. I want to talk to you about what Philip didn't dwell on. He didn't dwell on his encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch went away rejoicing. Why? Because he had salvation. He had eternal life. He had more than the temple could ever offer him. He understood the Messiah. He may not know all the scroll or all the Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh. He didn't know any about the New Testament had been written yet. But what he knew was Jesus was the fulfillment of the scripture that he had trusted as a Mosaic law. Philip didn't dwell on past miracles. He moved straight ahead and he continued to preach in towns until he reached Caesarea. So here's the deal. This amazes me. Philip baptizes him. They come up out of the water. 
And all of a sudden, the dude's standing there by himself. Philip's gone. How do you explain that? You know, a lot of people rationalize that. I've read commentaries that rationalize that away. They say, well, it just doesn't mention him going and back to the town of Azotus. It says that the spirit of the Lord suddenly took him, took him. That's what it's going to be like in the rapture of the church. We're suddenly going to be taken and we're going to be planted somewhere else. It's going to be a plain air ride. And I think about that, and I, as some people, and, and I, you know, in other denominations, I hadn't always been a Baptist. I was raised, I was raised high as 57th variety. My dad was in the Army. I was an Army brat, and we went to every kind of church on the face of the earth. I think it was kind of church sampling, you know, through the ages. Ultimately, when I read the scriptures, I believed in what Southern Baptists teach to be closest to what the scriptures interpret. Okay, so let me not promote Baptists, but let me promote the gospel. Let me promote Christ and Christianity and say that some people focus all their attention on this snatching away, this miracle, the movement of the Holy Spirit, the catching away. And I think all that's wonderful, and I think that's cool. But I think more important than that is the fact what Philip did when he got to Azotus. He kept teaching and preaching and proclaiming Jesus. And he did it in every town and village he came to as he made his way back and north up to Caesarea. So I want, here's our take home today. This is what I want you to leave with. So make sure you grasp this. As much as you may have done for God in the past, he's looking for what you're doing today. Do I hear even one amen? You know, you may have done things. You may have witnessed. You may have led people to Christ before. You may have swept the aisles and cleaned the church and whatever, taught Sunday school, and that's wonderful. What are you doing today is the question. And secondly, God wants to lead you to encounters that are miraculous and have eternal outcomes. It is not enough to say, I'm satisfied where I am, I'm going to heaven, I got a good church, uh, people love me, and so I'm cool. No, listen, you are on mission for God. Do you understand? You are on mission. Your life is not your own. You have been bought with a price. And thirdly, he expects you to know the gospel so you can tell somebody how to know him and have eternal life through him. You need to know the gospel. Well, we really made it simple with a couple of arrows, amen? We got a, a little tomb thing and an arrow up and an arrow down. That's the gospel. You need to memorize it. And when you do, don't think you're done. Don't live in the past. Keep moving ahead. Never quit. Never sit down. And never give up.